I don't know uh, whether to um, feel uh, gypped or uh, to feel blessed. Um, feel a little bit gypped that, you know, the slot that I ended up in is right after lunch because everybody's had a good feed. And that's a nice time to kick back and have a sleep. And some of you probably snuck in here to do exactly that. That's all right. But, <laughs> oh, just in the front row. <laughs> um, although, uh, I kind of feel blessed that I actually got this room because it's so bloody cold and you don't want to eat anyone's food. So, uh, you're going to have to stay awake and listen to what I've got to say. So, my name is uh, Scott Ray and I work for Digicert and I put some credentials up there. And I want to touch on those because they have some context to uh, what I'm going to talk about today. I've actually been doing PKI for a long time, maybe close to 20 years, and uh, in one form or another, started out in uh, a country like this one. Um, originally from Australia, been here in the US about 15 years, and uh, almost exclusively spent my time working in PKI environments, one or the other, during that period. A lot of my recent experience has been around uh, architecting and ensuring that uh, policies and processes are correct for PKI. But I spent lots of time in the early days actually integrating PKI into applications. And as you will hopefully find out by the end of this presentation, bolting on security or bolting on a PKI is, is not necessarily a good way to start out and plan uh, to implement security. Um, and I learned that in the first part docs. So uh, I have spent some time uh, down in the weeds and I do still currently spend time uh, down in the weeds in the technology, not as much time as I would like, but it's nice to have the option while to me. So uh, we're going to spend roughly about 50 minutes. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay because I sound alright from the beard. You guys in the back, you're all good. Yeah. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about trust and PKI, and there's probably a bunch of you in here who might go to sleep through some of this, and that's quite okay. I wasn't necessarily made aware of, of uh, what the experience of those attending would have, and so there's some background stuff here, and a lot I'll skip over, and, and folks can refer to it later on. I do want to um, cover in detail, though, uh, some of the implications of uh, trust and PKI. And that will become apparent in this presentation. Uh, I'm going to give an example of web security, which I think most folks are familiar with. But there's some implementation aspects that are really important to consider when you're thinking about uh, perhaps utilizing that same infrastructure for the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things, by the way, can refer to a lot of things. Maybe it's identity of things, Internet of Things. IoT is just a well overclocked uh, acronym. And, uh, it was really interesting at CES this year. I don't know if any of you attended CES in uh, in Vegas. Uh, not my favourite town, um, but it was just heavy-handed in regards to everybody was doing IoT. It was the flavour of the month, and so I think that we will still find a consolidation of the market and what it actually means. Um, and so I think today's topic, hopefully to all of you, is relevant. I'm going to talk about um, those traditional PKI principles that are a part of implementing a web PKI and then apply them to what differences you might want to take into account if you want to utilise security in an IoT context. Um, I'm going to give another example at the end of the day of what's happening in uh, grids used for supercomputing um, and some of the unique implementations that they use which whilst not a traditional IoT implementation as I would call it, I think is a good analogy to draw. And then uh, hopefully at the end, provide some advice on what app developers should do uh, when it comes to uh, security um, dealing with devices. I should say that I have spent a lot of time recently um, focused on devices in the medical field. I know we had an excellent talk from uh, on productivity yesterday, talking about some of the issues that are there. And uh, these are real issues that need to be dealt with. And unfortunately, if we take the approach of uh, web security, which is part of the reason why we're going to go through an example of web security, which is, you know, start out and make everything available right off the bat and then worry about bolting on security afterwards. 
you're actually going to run into some issues and that sort of approach. So, some initial concepts um, about establishing trust because essentially this is the context of what I'm talking about, trust between two devices, um, whether that's to exchange data um, or um, to facilitate services one with another is exactly what we're trying to do. So I have a definition of trust up there. But the, probably the most important thing that I want you to take away from today um, is that you know, trust cannot be established by technology alone. And a lot of folks, folks think, hey, if I want to implement security, if I could choose um, public key uh, cryptography, I just bolt it on and, and I'm secure. And in actual fact, what you end up with is uh, PKT, or public key technology, and um, PKT does not actually establish trust because you also have to take into account policies and procedures around how that PKT is implemented. Otherwise, you may never establish trust between two entities. And you also have to take into account the relationships and liabilities that are going to come into play when those two entities interact. When you take all three of those aspects together, the technology, the, the policies, the, the processes and procedures, and the agreements in terms of liability and use, etc., then that's when you get the actual I at the end of PK, that's the infrastructure. So when you have all three elements, you end up with the PKI, and if you take anything away from today, it's the crypto, which is PKT, does not establish trust alone. You have to take into account the other aspects. So, we have uh, PKI, it underpins the trust on the web these days. It's been around for a long time. Um, and generally speaking, I can't actually think of an issue where the protocol itself has been an issue. Generally speaking, the chinks in the armor of uh, PKI for web security has generally been implementation issues, whether it was the wrong algorithm or wrong key size that we used, etc. These are all implementation algorithms to do with uh, policy or um, a misunderstanding of who had responsibility for what, so maybe part of the um, relationship aspect of um, public key crypto. So it actually wasn't the, the technology itself that was the issue, it's how you implement it and how you use it. So essentially, um, what is PKI? It really includes those uh, three elements that I mentioned. And generally, there's a number of services that we want to get out of the infrastructure. And they are roughly categorized into this triangle here, the CIA triangle. No, it's not an acronym or a um, US federal agency. Um, but it really is about uh, confidentiality, ensuring that you know one device to another does not reveal, or transmission from one device to another does not reveal anything that it shouldn't. It's about integrity, and that the message that sent is actually the message that was received, it wasn't changed, modified, uh, deleted along the way. And it's about access control, that those that should have access to those resources are actually granted access to those resources. And a key element of that is actually identity. So identifying who the players are, uh, the actors are in, in the, the infrastructure that's been set up. So again, um, Generally speaking, the web PKI, um, confidentiality, there are a number of tools that are utilized, and I'll briefly run through some of those. I don't think I need to cover that. I think we've been through those all right. I want to talk specifically about an implementation of PKI, which is uh, the internet of the web PKI. Generally speaking, you have somebody who is connecting to a service uh, via some user agent, typically a browser, and they're uh, connecting to some resource that's serving up um, content, uh, a server, and there is a way of making this happen securely. And there are some dependencies that need to be taken into account from the get-go, otherwise you don't end up with security. You may think you have security, but you don't. So here's the general process. I really just wanted to highlight who the players are. I wish I had a pointer, but I left that behind. So here on the... Uh, the right, you basically have two agents at either end that are trying to communicate with each other. On this side, you have a user who's using the browser as an agent. On this side, you have the server, which is the agent that's serving up the content. You have a certification authority, 
um, that facilitates the introduction of these two or the reintroduction of these two uh, entities. And uh, then you have the, the protocol that's operating that allows exchange to happen. The interesting thing about it is this is not just a single entity who is responsible for ensuring that security services are established. And in actual fact, it's the responsibility of the, the four entities that are listed up there. Everybody actually has to pay a party. Your certification authority that you're relying upon uh, is not secure. You don't establish trust. If the site operator who's setting up the content uh, doesn't configure things correctly, you may not establish trust. And so on and so forth. And so as a user, we generally think of um, the web PKI generally being uh, one directional in that you have a um, side operator who is authenticating themselves to the user's uh, agent so that uh, content can be relied upon that's being sent to them. But also um, in web PKI, you can, have, you can establish uh, two-way communication, two-way trust, where the uh, user also authentic, oh, awesome, thank you. Where the user also authenticates themselves uh, to the service. And in that case, you actually have both parties authenticated and trust operating in both directions. That is also a mode that operates. Although in the traditional sense of WebPKI, it's, it's usually one direction. Uh, I'm not going to cover what is a certification authority. Hopefully everybody in here knows what one of those does. Um, but I think it is important to briefly touch on what the responsibilities of the certification authority is. Because as I mentioned earlier, if that CA is not implemented correctly, or not operating in accordance with policies, then you actually will not establish trust, and so it's a key component. So number one, um, some key elements, because we're gonna generalize some of these elements and, and, and talk about how they can be utilized or how the web PKI applies to IoT. Um, you have roots of trust that get established um, in some user agent or um, in the, on the server side, in the operating system, etc. That's a key element of trust. Those are actually distributed. So if you're an app developer, that's analogous to you have to have some way of establishing your roots of trust in your app. Whether you intend to rely upon the underlying operating system, there are some holes to consider in taking that approach, or whether you want to manage that yourself is a consideration that you have to take into account. Generally speaking, the web PKI, you actually have a third, rigorous third-party order of operations and policy. This is a key element of establishment of trust, especially for parties that are previously unknown to each other. And the key element in the technology is protecting those private keys. Uh, again, I don't think I have to go into the details of its public key technology. Cryptography, you have two keys. One you make as public as possible. You put that in a certificate and distribute it as broadly as possible. And the private key uh, has to be protected because essentially that is the crown jewels of establishing the security. If they get compromised or have access in any way, you actually lost trust with them. Um, so generally speaking, an application will have some type of trusted root store that has to be managed over a lifetime and generally it's not static. So if you're going to implement this yourself in your app, you have to have some way and process for keeping that updated and maintained over time based on feedback in the community about the trustworthiness of the CAs that you trust. And um, there are rules that come into play of how that happens. Now a lot of us probably generally in the web PKI I don't think too much about that, but you know, uh, Google has uh, rules about who it lets into its trust store, as does Microsoft, as does Mozilla. Etc. and so <coughs> the list of browsers, Apple, Safari, etc. So a certification authority, when it's going to be part of this web PKI, is going to establish um, some bona fides about the entities that are in play. It could be about the, the user themselves, identifying the user, but typically in the one-way um, process, it's, it's about the server that the user is going to be connected to. And there are different levels at which this can be done, and we know this in browsers, for instance. Um, there's generally three levels that I refer to. Most people only refer to, but there's three levels. There's, there's DB, which is domain validated, which basically means someone paid a little bit of money and got a name in a, in a registry and 
and uh, someone ping that registry and says, yep, it's active and, and that's it. Then there are further controls about validating who actually stands behind that uh, entity that did that registration, uh, all the way up to extended validation, which changes the UI in the browser. I bring that up because if you're going to implement something in your app, then you may want to consider that there are different levels of assurance in the types of credentials that are issued by a CA, and you may want to have the flexibility in your app of identifying the differences between them. Uh, there are various roles that come into play when you're establishing this trust. You know, the CA is going to provide certificates that are those trusted routes, and there is going to be a chain up to those of uh, in the browsers, so that's a relationship between the CA and the browsers. Um, they're going to verify the subject, as I said, and then the site operators have some things that they need to do. They actually have to generate these key pairs securely, um, and they have to provide that securely to the CA so that there's a binding between identity and keys. That's essentially what a CA does. And they have to um, potentially, if they want two way communications, provide a way of requesting certificates from whoever's going to authenticate, etc. And then uh, the user, they go to the HTTPS site and if they get that little lock signal, they can generally know that they are trusted. Although, um, as we've heard at various other um, presentations throughout this, um, depending on the quality of the, the UI, that might not also be the case. Uh, if the root that root is not in your app, or it's not in the browser, then you're not going to establish trust. But that's not a one-time event. I talked before about, you know, there needs to be ongoing maintenance of whatever trust score that you're going to implement. And you can publish uh, CRLs, certificate revocation lists, or status about certificates that have been issued by the online certificate status protocol. There's SCPP as well, another protocol that's utilized, although not as much. And with PKI, it's typically CRLs and, and OCSP. A certificate may be revoked or if it's expired, then generally you will get some type of warning from the user agent to let the user decide whether they want to proceed or not. And we heard yesterday uh, about uh, Chrome doing some things with that in terms of guiding the user uh, in the direction that they want to go. And then there has to be ongoing annual audits of the CAs to ensure that they are actually following all the policies that the um, browser, if that's the root score or the operating system, if that's what the browser is relying upon, uh, are still being met. And if there's not, there has to be some remediation to remove those roots of trust. Okay. What is the browser's role in the establishment of trust? Well, they are, are actually going to publish, uh, generally not widely, but they do publish a set of requirements that says, you know, what's necessary in order for you to get into uh, my trust or to be trusted with your roots. And generally speaking, um, over time that can be a challenge. If, for instance, you're a new certification authority that's starting out today, essentially you will get distributed in today's version of that browser, which will probably have a very small population that relies upon it, and it can take up to six, seven years uh, before you have ubiquitous distribution if you were to start out today. And so one way of solving that issue that um, some of today's certification authorities will do is they will employ a mechanism called a cross certificate. So you take somebody who's already in the browser and convince them to cross sign your route so that you suddenly have trust in backwards compatibility. And that process in and of itself is a challenging process to ensure whoever's going to cross on you to trust you that you are following the processes that they have to follow in order to keep their route in that browser. Um, the browser has to have an update process to allow those to change over time, whether it's new ones or old ones that expire that are going away or have uh, key sizes, etc., that are, are no longer utilized. And the browsers periodically review the audit data Typically, they rely upon third-party audits. It's Web Trust 2.0 these days. That uh, a CA usually has to go through on an annual basis to demonstrate a number of controls and criteria to uh, an audit organisation that specifically uh, has uh, a set of controls around how CA should operate. And browsers typically rely upon that for passing various grades, levels of assurance in, in the application itself. <coughs> 
So again, for app developers, um, if you are either going to rely upon this, you need to understand that this is a process and that there are different levels of assurance in the routes that you rely upon, or if you're going to duplicate this yourself, then you need to take into account that there are potentially different levels of assurance in the way that CAs operate. All CAs are not the same. So again, you know, the browser has a responsibility when somebody um, goes to an HTTPS site, they perform uh, a number of checks based upon uh, the certificate that's presented and the path that is being used to return content. I'm not going to go into those too much detail. And again, if something is missing, for instance, it's not generally a root certificate issuing an entity, so there's generally a, a range of intermediates in between there. That's one way of partitioning a community so it doesn't get too large, so that CRLs don't get too large, etc. Um, this chain of certificates actually has to be in, uh, in place for uh, trust to be established. So again, if you are developing your own trust law on your app, you have to have some way of managing, perhaps dynamically, the update of those uh, intermediates. The site operator has a number of responsibilities and if the site operator does not do this, then you may not establish trust. Keeping in mind that in the case of if you're building an app that allows um, two devices to uh, exchange information, um, one of those devices may be the equivalent of a site operator. So you've got to take into account the way in which your devices connect, who controls those devices. And there may be some configuration items in those devices that are going to determine whether you actually end up with a trusted um, exchange of data or not. In the terms of WebPKI, um, there are a number of things the site operator must do in terms of keys, in terms of um, registering uh, with the DNS, etc., uh, where their server is going to be uh, serving up content from. And they have to choose a CA that's trusted in a set of browsers that they want to be compatible with for their, their users. And there are different certificate types, so they have to make a decision about what level of assurance they want in terms of the um, connection that's going to be established. They also have to uh, monitor their site to make sure that if there are changes to their security that they reflect that appropriately. Otherwise, they won't necessarily, even if they have a secure connection, you may not uh, establish trust with your set of users. And there are controls typically placed in the certificate that is served up for um, the site that says how long the key can be used and what it could be used for. So if you're an app developer, you need to consider in advance what type of services you want to enable and therefore what is the configuration of the certificates that are going to be relied upon if there are timeouts that need to be considered, etc. What is the user going to do? Um, hopefully they have to protect their user agent to ensure that it's run in a secure manner. So again, if you're implementing an app, uh, you may control that environment, um, but there are configurations uh, that need to be taken into account that will determine whether security gets established or not. There could be malicious uh, software that interferes with the app that you're developing that you might have to fend off, etc. There are exceptions that you can make. A user may be able to configure, you may have the browser that makes a decision about who they want to trust, but the browser might also allow the user to configure their own routes to trust, which might compromise your trust model that you're intending to rely upon. Again, if you're an app developer and you intend to rely upon whatever the base operating system or browser is <coughs> user agent for establishing your security, uh, this is something that you're going to need to know. So, it is not just plug in the technology and I'm secure. There are actually responsibilities that each party needs to take into account and there are ways of verifying whether those parties are actually doing the things that they need to. So again, uh, coming back to my original point, if you just plug in PKI technology, you don't end up with security. So if you're an app developer, don't think, oh well, I'm just gonna rely upon whatever library is gonna provide PKT. Uh, that's not sufficient to establish trust. So, there are a number of things to consider. I've put some of them up there. Uh, one of the key elements 
to think about if you're doing something for Internet of Things is that the system almost never remains in a constant state. So over time, if there's a configuration change, how do you catch that configuration change? And does it have an impact on your security? Because potentially it does. So you have to have some way of, of managing that. Um, not all users have a clear understanding of what their responsibility is in the system. And so, uh, especially if you're dealing with IoT, sometimes it can be really difficult to understand who the real user is. Is it the actual device that you're dealing with, or is it some administrator who's responsible for that device? Who actually takes responsibility? And that's a key element, uh, especially in healthcare. So, generalizing PKI, there are essentially three groups of responsibilities. There's a certification authority that acts as the trusted introducer. Um, they are typically binding known identities to keys. It's usually identity based. And uh, they establish a trust relationship with whatever the user agent is by embedding their roots. Then you have users. So these are the parties that wish to remotely exchange data. Um, it may be an individual, a process, or in the case of IT, it may be a device. And they have identity and attributes, other attributes besides identity that will come into play that may need to be verified. I've said here by a CA, but that could be any trusted third party that you're using before for this purpose. And then there's the user agent in the terms of app developers. That's probably the app that you're developing. Um, you have to have some rules about how you establish trust. Um, you have to verify um, what comes through from the CA, perhaps, in terms of uses and attributes and whether they meet your local trust policies. And then you have to facilitate the encoding and decoding and do the, the PK technology itself. So again, that's the process. A key element of CAs is identity binding, and that's the traditional PKI. It is identity. But if you're going to do IoT, generally speaking, you are not going to deal with just identity. There will be a number of attributes about the um, device that will also come into play in your trust model. Certificate chains, again, are an important aspect of uh, if you're building your own trust model, how do you plan to implement these? Uh, because it's not just a root of trust, and there may be several levels of and they all have to chain in order for the PK technology to actually work. So, if we are going to build an app to facilitate um, integration of uh, devices and interaction of devices, then there are a number of things that we need to take into account in the three categories that I just mentioned and generalize for BKI. The CA will still act as a trusted introducer of the devices, um, but is it the device user or is it the service or app? That's a question that needs to be asked. It will still bind device identities to keys, but what is the nature of that device identity? You have to understand that's part of the relationships that have to be defined that I mentioned earlier. Um, the user um, is that party that wants to exchange data remotely and it could be something that has limited capability so um, when designing uh, how much flexibility you want in the trust policies that are going to be implemented that's another consideration that has to come into play um, again you have pretty much the same elements in the three areas if you're going to facilitate secure transactions between devices as we uh, demonstrate and we generalize the PKI components from earlier. Your user agent, and this is probably analogous to the app that you're building, are you going to manage a trust store? Um, and, and if you are, what are those assurance going to, assurances going to be based on? What are the policies that you're going to be using? Which are the CAs that you plan to trust? Because that could change over time. And, you know, how do you intend to update those things over time? Establishing secure channels between um, identified users with known attributes. What happens when those attributes change? That's another thing that you're going to have to take into account. In the so what are some of the challenges? When you're dealing with the device, it's difficult to know who speaks authoritatively for that particular device, unless this is spelled out clearly in the relationships in the PKI that we mentioned earlier. How does a CA or some other authority verify the authenticity of the relationship of maybe an administrator to the device itself? And what happens when 
that responsibility changes. So, you know, if I have a fridge that's connected to the internet and it's sending my grocery order off to Costco uh, every week, then uh, if I sell that fridge on Craigslist, how do I tell Costco not to bill me for the next customer's order? These are some of the challenges that get faced. These are some of the attributes that need to be managed when you're dealing with uh, devices. The other question that comes up is what actually constitutes uh, an identity of the device? Is it just a unique identifier associated with the device? And is that sufficient to enable the authorization? Using the example that I said of the fridge, um, what happens when those permissions need to change from one user to the other? Who is authoritative to say that I now solve this on Craigslist? How do we convey the information? That needs to be built into what infrastructure you utilize to manage trust. Devices whose attributes change over time. So it might be a physical device. Uh, that physical device identity might not change, but if it's moved to a different segment of the network, then it might need to be treated differently. So that's another consideration that needs to come in, into play. And generally speaking, if you have some unique identifier that's linked to the device over its entire lifetime, as it moves and plays different roles or has different configurations within the system, then there are typically a different set of permissions that need to be managed. And generally speaking, that set of permissions is not in sync with the time period for the lifetime of you know, an identity credential that might be issued. Identity credentials are typically issued long term, when I say long term, maybe one to five years, sometimes up to 20 years in the middle of the year, in terms of device identity. But the role that that device plays changes during that time. And so utilizing the identity certificate to identify or do the authorization for the change in roles is not a practical thing to do. So you need some other mechanism to manage the attributes about that identity when it comes to uh, devices. So, there are essentially three ways that you could potentially manage those attributes, and I've listed those up here. You can have some type of local database. Generally, that does not scale because there's an issue with how does the authority know and you, as the app developer, know which set of databases to rely upon and they don't necessarily scale too well. You could use something like attribute certificates, that's IRC uh, 3820, um, which is a way, a great way actually of doing delegation um, with identities. But generally speaking, you have much shorter lived certificates, so you can say, you know, I have my identity certificate, I can delegate a new certificate from that identity certificate using attribute service. And these are the attributes that it's good for, and you can give it a shorter lifetime. That is one way of, of doing it, but it's not necessarily an efficient way of managing attributes. Or you could use some type of other mechanism of delivering the attributes. Uh, SAML. Uh, SAML assertion is a common way of having a shorter lifetime that is linked or associated with the identity credential for the device in some way. So those are three potential options that you could utilize for managing the shorter term attributes um, that are linked to the identity of the device itself. And I want to do a quick review of um, how this is actually utilized in supercomputing today. And although I wouldn't necessarily call it a traditional uh, device, or an IoT implementation, I think there are not a lot of analogies that can be drawn when you are implementing um, security for uh, IoT. So uh, today in the world of uh, supercomputing, there is a global trust federation that has been set up. And so there are about 90 odd country, uh, countries that are represented in the trust federation where there are identity providers, uh, typically CAs in supercomputing, it is always a traditional X509 CAs that are utilized for identifying resources. Um, and those federations act on a global basis. So if you, uh, there are actually three chapters to the federation, one in North and South America, there's one in Europe and there's one in Asia Pacific. You can be accredited by any one of those federations as a certification authority to meet the standards. They publish what those standards are. And if you're uh, accredited by any one of those bodies, then the other two bodies uh, at the annual meeting ratify those decisions so that there are issuers that are then recognized on a global basis. There is um, 
namespace partitioning based on where you're from. And so you end up with unique identifiers for those who are issuers of identities um, in the grid space. In the grid example that I'm going to go through, um, they utilize a traditional um, identity certificate to then delegate a limited use attribute certificate that has some attributes in it um, that might be related uh, to a specific job. And then they also use SAML assertions to manage other attributes about the local policy depending on um, the service that you're connecting to. And this allows anybody who receives an identity credential to be managed locally by their local organisation but have access to global resources. So if I'm an independent researcher or a physicist and I want to um, do some work on the facility uh, in, in Geneva, the collider that's there, then I can do so with a, a locally issued identity certificate and locally managed attributes about my ability to access that. Generally, you know, slices of time on supercomputers and on facilities um, like that, that and the LHC um, are managed and costly and uh, built back to an institution. And generally speaking, researchers can gain time on this, but if they mess up in uh, the jobs that they run and they cause an issue, there has to be traceability back to who was the cause of doing that. So I'm going to quickly run through what grids do and how they utilize both attribute certificates and some assertions to accomplish this, and then draw some analogy at the end of how this can be applied to uh, setting up security for IoT in general. So here is your typical scenario for, for grids. You have um, some user who's sitting at a console there. There is typically some workload management that lives out in the cloud that allows them to connect either to compute resources or storage resources, depending on the type of um, resources that is, need, that is needed, um, but in order to get access to this, it has to be managed in, in some way. So typically the setups can happen in one or two ways. You might have like a, a private cluster, and so everything might be happened and managed at an individual facility here, and they manage everything from the job, including who has access and what happens if somebody does something wrong. Or you might have uh, some type of cloud example where there is some distributed uh, virtual management interface that allows you to connect and access a range of resources, whether they're compute or um, data driven. And either way, you have uh, typically some type of local organization in the grid space, they call it virtual organization. So that's a, a local uh, authorization aspect, and that's where attributes about you and what you can do are going to actually be aggregated. So, in the grid example, they have more than one administrator at the moment, because this could be anywhere in the world, and more than one service provider, again, it could be anywhere in the world. And there's lots of users still with lots of different transactions. There are different authorities that are trusted, that 90 odd that I mentioned for uh, IGTF, but they have a single operating instance across the entire world. And so, they all need to be able to work together, utilizing local authorizations, <coughs> a global identity infrastructure, um, and they actually managed to make that work pretty well. So, one of the things that they have to accommodate is that the assertions about what you're allowed to do in the grid space might come from multiple sources, and they can be controlled locally. They need to accommodate delegation. Uh, typically speaking, they are using attribute certificates to do that. That's historical because the access to run grid jobs again is X509 based, but they then have to understand that you might not necessarily have some virtual organization that manages that for you, and so you have to still cater for individuals in some way, and that all of these different resource providers have to understand that not everybody has implemented their trust the same, and you have different levels of assurance in either the identity of the researcher that is connecting, or in the attributes about what they're allowed to do. These are all considerations if you're building your own app, for instance, that you would also need to take into account. So, 
Here's your typical example. You have a home organization. There's some identity authority that uh, does the identifying in the home organization. It's local. And therefore, you typically, in the grid sense, you actually do in-person uh, photo-based identification to prove who you are. That's generally a high-level assurance on NIST 800 uh, 63 scale, it's level 3. Um, you have some virtual organization that you register what this individual is able to do. There's some access control, and then you run through the resource managers that has to pass all that information and decide whether this uh, individual can run this job in this particular time frame. One of the things that the grid example does really well in delegating rights and privileges for a user is they take their long-term identity credential and they create a, a delegation certificate which is short-lived. So you can assign a whole lot of privileges to the short-lived that you wouldn't want to assign long-term. Um, that reduces your risk. And then you have some resource broker that then has to interpret um, a, a set of rights that might be provided by the local organization as well. And generally speaking, uh, in the grid example, they are doing the delegation through proxy certificates, as I mentioned earlier, and then using SAML assertions for the local attributes to be managed. So the VOs, the virtual organization, is the directory of members, groups, roles, and attributes, and that can be implemented in one of three ways. You can have something that's relatively static and passed out of band, not very flexible. Um, you could have something that's downloaded in advance, in advance from some directory. Again, the update of the directory, you don't necessarily have up-to-date information based on how often that update has happened. Or you can use bombs, which is the method that I was mentioning where you have some assertions and those can be granted uh, in real time and can be updated on the fly if needed. So BOMS is the, uh, an example of one way if you are building an application. Uh, this is a prototype of what you might want to use if you're going to manage both identity about a device in IoT and attributes that need to be managed at different points of time for that device. So the authorization flow is fairly simple. Um, the user authenticates to their local virtual organization. They are then granted perhaps a proxy certificate and a SAML assertion, which allows the resource uh, manager to then determine uh, whereabouts they need to gather their resources from, and those resources uh, have explicit trust arrangements with the manager, and as long as the right credentials are presented, then it allows um, very flexible um, use of resources or movement of data between uh, two ends. The system. So in the example of the grid, the attributes can come from many sources because you can be a part of multiple virtual organizations. And so one of the things in the grid world that they understand, um, there are really two aspects that need to be catered for. A, there is um, an authentication aspect, which usually the identity certificate is useful, and then there's an authorization aspect. So based on your identity and the set of attributes that are in the assertions that are provided, um, you're authorized to do various things. And when you're developing a trust environment for a, an app that's dealing with devices, you will typically have to deal with those uh, same two scenarios. And there will be, as I mentioned earlier, perhaps multiple levels of assurance in the identity credential or the assertions being made depending on the source that they come from. And you need to implement a system that caters for both of those. So what the grid world came up with is the need for another authority. They call that an attribute authority. Um, and it performs a similar role to what a CA does for identity, but it's an authority for the attributes that are then going to be associated with the identity. So, what's the translation uh, for the grid example for an app that's being developed for IoT? So, the grid example, you have identity PKI that's being utilized in conjunction with the local attribute authority. Those long-lived identity certificates that we typically see in an identity PKI, um, 
by themselves, they're just not flexible enough to also manage the minutiae around uh, local authorizations for attributes that are associated with whatever the particular job is that's being done. And so the addition of the attribute authority service, as well as the traditional PKI, provides the flexibility that is needed. And then making these two services work together is potentially one model for IoT developers. So, what does this mean for those that are developing um, applications that allow um, devices to communicate? PKI is a great technology, it's probably the best technology we have for securing things, but it's not something that you can necessarily just bolt on and it will work. You've got to take into account all the other aspects. There's policies, there's relationships, all those things need to be managed. You have to decide whether you're going to do that yourself in your app or whether you're going to rely upon um, some underlying base system like the web PKI, but web PKI isn't necessarily as flexible as probably what you're going to need. At least it has not proven so within healthcare. So you may need to involve establishing multiple attribute authorities and you have to figure out some way that you're going to trust them. And an easy way of doing that is if you have a set of CAs that you trust, you can utilize that trust mechanism to bootstrap your attribute authority, but you have to have a number of policies and processes that come into place to support that. So to do that, to trust an attribute authority, you should follow a similar process that you use for establishing your certification authority that just becomes a late implementation. So you should have some policy that says how they should operate. Um, the attribute authority should publish their practices that says this is how they implement the policies. The CA would then verify that, that they're actually doing that, whether themselves or through some certification process. And then they could issue an identity certificate to the attribute authority which is part of your trust infrastructure already for identity. And then the AA will follow its published policies for issuing attributes to make assertions about devices using that certificate that's been issued to them. And when device attribute change, the local attribute authority can issue an assertion or a previous assertion, etc., using the same mechanisms that we use today for um, certificates. And if the attribute authority misbehaves, you have the capability of the CA uh, deregistering or deauthorizing it, essentially. So, what does this mean? That is one model for perhaps implementing trust. Um, if you were to adopt that model, one of the things that you have to be careful about is who you choose as your CA partners because all CAs are not uh, equal. So you want to take a look to determine which partner you want to work with um, look at the depth and breadth of services that they already provide, what communities they provide services in. Um, what is the risk of doing business with this partner? That's something that you need to understand. Have they had breaches in the past? If so, how have they resolved them? Um, we have to understand that security is a continuum. There is no perfect security. And so generally speaking, it's not a matter of if you've been breached, it's when you were breached and how you fixed it should be the benchmark against which you um, perhaps upgrade your potential partners. Uh, you should look for a CA that is potentially willing to operate under more restrictive policies and perhaps give you your own intermediate, etc. That gives you a, a, a lot greater flexibility in terms of policy enforcement. And you also want to consider whether the model of public trust is really going to be sufficient because in most cases for IoT, certainly my experience in healthcare here in the US has been that it's not what's acceptable for public trust is not acceptable for um, the regulations that are required to help you in the process. So, that's the end of my presentation. Any questions?
manufacturing context, perhaps that we talked about, where all the sensors are located, then there should be actually some local authority there in the analogy of the grid space that would be a virtual organization, but in essence, the manufacturing organization itself, that should have a specific authority that operates that can then make more granular determinations about what device will have what permissions in what <coughs> So that attribute authority would also rely upon the certification of those for bootstrapping its trust, but it would actually then uh, further petition the trust mechanism for those individual devices that are communicating with each other so that you can change how you trust them based on if their configuration changed, if their location changed, if their ownership changed. You can't do that very well with just the identity certificate because typically it's long lifetime and the CA would have a hard time being able to go into your local implementation and being able to say, oh, when this little thing changed, I need to reissue the certificate. It becomes cost prohibitive. But an attribute authority, which is local, which has local knowledge, can issue assertions that fulfills that um, capability and can revoke those that changes and it uses the trust of the CA to do that. Okay, so for, for instance, uh, say Bluetooth Low Energy, so that's really good for sensors. These are really stupid devices, you know. Uh, they have a 128 bit UUID, which 32 bits is real, and they have a, they have a shared key. And so, one of the problems with low power Bluetooth is how you establish the shared key. Yes. So once they connect, that's how they talk to each other, this, this puny little shared key, but at least it's a shared key, not some. So, and so if you're using a certificate of authority, something like that's actually a good idea. You know, it seems like that maps pretty well in determining with the shared key. Am I right on that? It does. So it, it also depends, though, um, what your local context is, because the problem with the shared key is actually you know distribution of the key when you add some new device. How does it know the shared key? And if the shared key gets compromised, everything in your system is compromised. So it's actually well, each each device has a separate shared key with yep. with its uh, controlling host. Yes, and so in actual fact, in um, today, in smart grid applications that manage the delivery of uh, electricity, etc., um, there are some smart meters that do exactly that. They're not actually running a traditional PKI, they just do key management on a local basis. And so each device has its own unique key that is managed by the um, local critical and attribute authority, if you like, so it gets registered. And there are just keys. There's no actually certificate that's actually used. Um, in the case of the Zigbee devices, that's uh, Certicom, who's actually running the back end of that. So they are low powered um, devices. And use, utilizing something like Lipton Curve uh, helps in keeping the key size down, helps in making that all manageable. But in that particular case, they aren't actually using certificates, they are actually just using the raw keys. And an advantage of certificates over raw keys is it makes it easy to manage and remove them over time if you need to. Otherwise, having to go out and touch the device if something bad happens is a, is a problem. It's far better if you have some mechanism of um, an asymmetric key that allows you to update the symmetric key that you're going to use in trust. The key issue is that which kind of uses PKI is kind of novel, actually kind of cool idea, it is, you know, if you have a large number of IoT devices, let's say low power Bluetooth devices, they're all, uh, you do need to be able to revoke certificates and things. That actually is a very legitimate concern. However, the devices are really stupid. Also, so it means that the computation side on that sensor is very limited. Yeah, so like a Olympic curve photography, which I'm familiar with for media and media things, is probably beyond the capacity of a lot of these sensor devices. So you've got to make a decision, which is why, well, actually, in the, the power grid example that I gave, they probably do have the capacity. Yeah. elliptic curve certs, but there are going to be scenarios where you don't have that and you might have to deal with raw keys. But the problem with raw keys is that you don't have any central mechanism to do a replication if you need to. Yeah. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. so you, you've just got to weigh up the risks to the implementation and so that'll determine whether you're going to use raw keys or whether you're going to use certs. Certainly from a usability aspect, 
and a management aspect. I think using um, PKI like certificates is a better way of doing things because then you don't have to go out and touch things if something goes wrong and you lose that flexibility if you have raw keys. But you have to make a decision based on the capability of the devices that you're dealing with. Well, it's intriguing because the how to establish the shared keys is kind of why don't we, uh, sorry to interrupt, but why don't we wrap up so we can get there. Thank you very much for uh, presenting.